So that's the problem. That's the, that's the issue. Uh, I think Dr. Gordon did a wonderful presentation in explaining how we have to deal, what we have to deal with, what the challenge is. And as she pointed out, Ohio has really put together many, many solutions. Many of them, some of them are just starting, some of them are well on their way, some of them we've actually finished and executed, like the ORAS and the um, uh, SCRA uh, guidelines and everything else. But we have a long way to go. And so I wanted to then present to you what is the response in Ohio. And I'm particularly proud, as I mentioned before, of the VA and our relationship with the VA. And so they're going to consume the next hour of time, and they're splitting it up time-wise however they, they have chosen. So what I'm going to do is just give a quick introduction for the four speakers and then let them take it from there. But first of all, we have Dr. Director Hetrick. Uh, he, had, as I said before, has been a wonderful partner from the beginning on all of this. He's a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives. He's the network director, and they call it the Veterans Integrated Service Network, or VISN for short. We're VISN 10. And um, he has a lot of director experience, a lot of hospital experience that he brings. Dr. Padin is a chief of psycholog psychology service at the Lewis Stoke Center. He is a Vietnam War Army combat veteran. He is speaking all over the place. I keep seeing his name pop up, and I'm so excited to be able to hear him. And he's written a lot of articles on this issue as well. Jim Canelli, I've had many, many uh, uh, conferences with Jim, uh, both here and, and elsewhere. He's the network homeless coordinator in the VA system, Vision 10. Uh, there's a big homelessness project going on in Ohio. I am very proud of it, and he's going to share with us all about those responsibilities, and he's in charge of all of that homelessness project, which is one of the signature uh, attacks uh, and one of the key programs that uh, President Obama had uh, laid out. And then Teresa Sickman is the Dayton VA Medical Center, VG, VJO. A lot of you are familiar with the VJO, so she's going to bring us up to date on what we're doing in the VJO program, how it's progressing, how come we had to add another person to every center, and uh, how we can continue to pull the, uh, all the judges into using the VJOs. And so I'm just going to turn the next hour over then to these folks to take it as they see best fit. Thank you so much. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. Okay. Um, as uh, Justice Stratton mentioned, my name is Jack Hetrick, the uh, network director here in Ohio for the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, uh, Veterans Health Administration portion. And it's my pleasure uh, to be here and uh, spend a few minutes with you this morning. I have a wonderful team of people here that are going to give you lots of uh, good information, probably in much more detail than I can since uh, they work with this stuff day in and day out. <clears throat> I did want to uh, acknowledge uh, just uh, the comments of uh, Congressman Stivers, and uh, he and I have not had, uh, as he's a relatively new congressman, we haven't had a lot of time personally to work together. But uh, I do appreciate the remarks that he made uh, and his support for uh, our ongoing programs. It sort of reminded me that in November uh, 2006, when I first arrived here in Ohio, in the position that I have right now, coming from the uh, Chicago area, that, uh, you know, we, uh, we really uh, had a, uh, an operating budget to somewhere a little over a billion dollars, and here six years uh, later, we're up to almost $2 billion at the end of the year. So it's an incredible amount of resources that have come uh, into the state of Ohio and does intend to uh, serve veterans. And that uh, you know doesn't come easily in our system. I mean, we're in constant competition for resources among the other uh, networks around the country and uh, because we have such a, a good outreach program because we have so many folks dedicated to bring individuals into our system and we've had an unprecedented demand for new services from, uh, from veterans of all years that our workload has continued to keep pace and to grow um, uh, better than uh, many other networks around the country even though we're kind of one of the smaller ones and uh, that has helped us to get these additional resources that the Congress allocates uh, to, to the VA in general and then we get our, our portion of it. So it's really great to end up the, the most current fiscal year with, uh, as I said, spending almost uh, $2 billion in all of our programs uh, combined 
with mental health, homeless, and, and all the things that we're focusing on today, certainly getting a fair uh, and, and great percentage of those, of those increases. So I want to thank him and uh, all of the congressmen. We have several. Uh, we have uh, one on the House Veterans Affairs Committee and one on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. And those folks have been just tirelessly working to make sure we get what we need to, to operate here. Without that, none of the things we can do would really be possible for us to, uh, to uh, do easily. I think that, for me, the biggest change has been in six years is uh, we have really redefined medical care. Uh, in VA, and uh, we had those of, such as myself who have been who started in my career in 1978 in VA have uh, really had focused on an inpatient care setting and very traditional medicine. And now, I mean, we're just sort of we're we're doing things that I never imagined that we would be doing, and you're going to hear about some of these things today. I can remember uh, or. Back about 2007 or so, there was this rumbling or talk uh, about veterans' courts in a couple of places across the country, and folks like they, the acronym BJO, and, and uh, you know, so we, we sort of like uh, started small, but now we're really uh, we really have ramped up over the past couple of years uh, to be uh, in many cases leading uh, the country, as had been mentioned by our, our previous speaker. In, in these areas, so it's really a very you know, proud moment for me uh, because what we're all about is making sure that whatever we get in this network uh, in terms of dollars, people, or other resources, that it goes back into meeting the needs of veterans because that is our one and only mission that we have. And uh, you know, and I know everyone you know in Vision 10 is absolutely committed to that. Uh, it's been a great personal honor for me to have uh, developed the acquaintance with Justice Stratton. As she mentioned, uh, she was uh, just uh, was gracious enough to host our, uh, our medical center leadership here on uh, Monday and Tuesday of this week and uh, took time out of her busy schedule to uh, come down and uh, brief us on how things have been going from her perspective, what she's doing, and how she's been helpful. I, I know of no other advocate uh, anywhere that has been as strongly committed to service the veterans and helping in any way she can as Justice Stratton. So my, my thanks and my heartfelt appreciation go out to you, as you well know, and uh, we're going to miss you a, a great deal in your role as Justice, but we're counting on you to keep helping us after that. So thank you again. Um, my job was to sort of talk about the big picture. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the big picture because you really uh, need to hear what's going on in the local picture, and uh, these folks here are going to uh, really uh, help you to understand the uh, complex nature of what's going on now in, in their areas and what we're doing about it. And, but I do, I do think it's worth a few minutes to just talk about Secretary uh, Shinseki's uh, commitment to, uh, to uh, uh, the VA and uh, to VHA and to all these specialized programs that we're going to be talking about today. I have uh, the honor of uh, meeting with him usually twice a year uh, in a sort of one-on-one -on -one setting. If you count all the staff that are in the room, we're still one-on-one. -on -one. He's talking to me, I'm talking to him. And you know, I get an hour, uh, which is unprecedented in you know, most cabinet departments, I would guess, for someone in my, in my level in the organization to have that kind of face time with the secretary. And spending that hour with him is an incredible experience because you get to understand the, the feel, the commitment, the desire to really make a difference in the lives of veterans. And he's especially concerned about our newest generation of veterans and all the uh, difficulties they're, they're facing as they return from service. And I think that that's, that's evident in the fact that uh, of his uh, commitment uh, or statement to end homelessness and, uh, and truly, we are working very, very hard to do that. It's a big challenge uh, to, to accomplish that. And, but we're not going to stop. And, uh, and I know as long as he is the secretary and as long as we're uh, uh, supporting that initiative, the resources are coming to help us, I think we will do our best to get close to that uh, and continue to uh, you know, develop programs that will 
identify folks before they get into that situation so we can interact or intercede at an earlier stage. I think that, uh, you know, in, in the area of homelessness, and just according to the uh, Housing and Urban Development uh, Department, veterans aged 18 to 30 are more than two times likely to be homeless as young non-veterans, and young veterans living in poverty are 3.7 times likely to be homeless as young non-veterans uh, living in poverty. So we're already starting, you know, we see a clear disadvantage for those who have served in, in terms of likelihood to uh, have that, that, that unpleasant experience. I think you know, from the, also the VA's commitment to caring for veterans with uh, post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury is, uh, is apparent in the increasing numbers of mental health workers that we have uh, recruited and trained at the national level and we're continuing. Uh, we have an initiative right now to hire 5,000 more mental health providers uh, across the country uh, by, the, uh, by next uh, June, June 30th, I believe is the date on that. And we also received supplemental staff that we're uh, working to recruit uh, between now and the end of the year. Uh, and there were, well, I believe, what, 1,600 positions that, that were uh, uh, funded under that special initiative and our, our share in Ohio ended up only being about 12 and you might say well we didn't get our fair share well actually we it was based on what an assessment of what networks were already having done we're already doing and what what investments that, that we've made in our in our, uh, in our within our networks on our own and I think several years ago we really started down this path to make mental health a strong priority in Ohio before I came here it was a already a, a network that was identified as having a strong commitment to that mental health. And uh, so when they looked at us and they looked at the rest of the country, our numbers uh, uh, didn't look pretty darn good in terms of what we had already and what we were doing, so we got a smaller uh, portion of that. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's a statement that, that we had recognized that that was going to be one of our strong commitments for many years. and. Uh, so we didn't get that many folks, but we're continuing to, uh, to utilize every resource that we have to uh, up our numbers.